Planning to visit the Met in New York City, but unsure what famous artwork you should see? Don't worry, we are Met experts, so we've got you covered. Here are the most famous sculptures that you absolutely, positively should not miss when visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Sean from The Tour Guy, I'm at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, which is actually in Central Park too. And today I'm gonna to show you the top 21 things that you should see when you're inside the Met. Art is about emotion. It is an artist unleashing their innermost thoughts and feelings onto canvas for all to witness. It is such a powerful act that many have been criticized, scrutinized, and even killed just for doing it. If you look at the sculptures and don't feel anything, that is because you haven't heard its story. This is the very reason we recommend guided tours. If you hear the story and don't get chills, then it is not great artwork. You can make any museum visit more memory, but specifically here by joining a guided tour of the Met. We work with guides that have strong art history backgrounds and are skilled at the art of storytelling. And above all, having fun. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hook us up with a like and subscribe. You're gonna love this content. Security guys are like staring at me now. We're waiting. Number 21, Autumn Rhythm, Jackson Pollock. The number one complaint I hear about modern art and especially artists like Jackson Pollock is, I don't see anything besides some paint thrown on a canvas. What did they say? They say you can see like the cigarette burns and stuff for when he just like would put his cigarettes out on his, his paper, or flick the butts and things like that. Jackson Pollock once said, I intend to paint large, movable pictures which will function between the easel and the mural. The tendency of modern feeling is toward the wall, picture, or mural. Number 20, white, red, on yellow. As the name suggests, uses three primary colors. Using these bright colors, he is creating a joyous mood, as opposed to other paintings where he chose a darker mood or darker colors. Number 19, Gertrude Stein by Pablo Picasso. Stein's early patronage and friendship were critical to his success. He painted her during his so-called Rose Period. By studying his paintings, you can see how Picasso is slowly moving on to Cubism. Number 18, Young Mother Sewing by Mary Cassatt. At that time, it was still frowned upon for women to become professional painters. For example, she remarked while visiting the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia that women were patronized and not allowed to work with live models. Fed up, she moved to Paris, but even in avant-garde Paris, she wasn't allowed to attend one of Paris's most prestigious art schools. Number 17, Woman with a Parrot. If Gustave Cabret had been alive in the 1980s, he'd probably been part of like the Detroit Pistons bad boy squad or something. How can you not like a guy who proclaims himself to be proudest and most arrogant man in France? Amazing. Number 16, The Musicians. Caravaggio's life was anything but usual. For example, he walked around Rome with a sword and was supposedly part of a local gang and even killed a man in a duel. Number 15, Bacchanal, a fawn teased by children, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Bernini was only 18 years old when he created this. Therefore, it contrasts with his later work, which are more refined. Number 14, Venus and the Loot Player. Do you think that's a Da Vinci background, dude? William Durant, famed art historian, commented on this painting by saying, having learned the female beauty adorned or natural, would always find customers. Titian pursued the theme joyously. Yeah. Burgers of Calais. Auguste Rodin remains arguably the most famous French sculpture to date. His uh, idea was that he could just, um, he wants more people to see it and not for it to be a limited edition. Makes yeah. It makes sense, but it's very, you know, philosophical approach. Portrait of a woman with a man at a casement. The life of Fra Filippo Lippi is as fascinating as reading a book. Orphaned at a young age, his aunt gave him over to a monastery. According to Giorgio Vasari, pirates kidnapped him, literally pirates. Number 11, Dancing Celestial Deity. The Dancing Celestial Deity would make Gumby proud. The body twists and distorts in a way that is definitely not human. Personal remarks on this statue, Sean? <laughs> 
Number 10, the dance class, Edgar Degas. Degas invites us to follow these scenarios and natural lines as the painting guides our eyes to the back wall of the studio. The work is ultimately one of imagination. Number nine, the Temple of Dender. I mean, it's pretty cool. I, uh, I was actually talking to one of our tour guides before he came here, uh, one of our Met guides, obviously. And they were saying this is like one of the main attractions, obviously, the Met, because it's massive, it's a massive installation. But one of the coolest things about it is it's not actually Egyptian. Well, it is, but it's, it's commissioned by Augustus, the Roman Emperor. It's not commissioned by, you know, Pharaoh or, or anything like that. It was commissioned by the Emperor Augustus, and it was built in Egyptian style, obviously. It doesn't look like Roman style, uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, when you think about Egyptian structures and artwork and things like that, you just think, you know, must have been built under some fire or something like that. But, you know, I guess the, the Romans really try, it shows how the Romans really try to emulate other cultures and other styles like Hellenism and things like that. It'd be cool to actually see it live back in the day. Being built? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Number eight, Perseus with the head of Medusa. Countess Venaria Tarnowska of Poland purchased the replica of Perseus and gifted it to the Met. The original Perseus that Canova made is in the Vatican Museums. Seven, Ugolino and his sons. The theme for Ugolino and his sons goes back to the 13th century works by Dante, the Divine Comedy. Officials ordered the peace son, Count Ugolino della Gardesca, and his sons and his grandsons to prison for treason. It is a prison that they died of starvation. Number six, the Gulf Stream, Winslow Homer. Some flying fish, some blood in the water. I don't want to be in that situation. What feeling is worse than the bitter cold? The pain the woman is feeling from the cold is palpable. Even looking at it, it makes me shiver now. It never ceases to amaze me the skill involved in bringing alive such emotion from a cold piece of metal. Number four, Venus Italica. Antonio Canova is considered the greatest neoclassical sculpture of the late 18th and early 19th century. Along with painters Jacques-Louis David, he was credited with ushering a new aesthetic of clear, regularized form and calm repose inspired by classical antiquities. Number three, Julie Lebrun looking in the mirror. Elizabeth Louis Viguet Lebrun. I chose this painting for number three on our list, not only due to its uniqueness and character, but also the impossible perspective. Yeah, well, what do you know about art? I'm an art historian, official tour guide of the Vatican. Through her front, she do, instead of doing a front portrait, she does it through the mirror. It's a really interesting it's painting. Insane. I mean, I could stare at it all day. It's ingenious. Number two, Washington crossing the Delaware. Arguably one of the most famous pictures of American patriotism. The painting represents Washington's perilous journey across the frozen Delaware River with immediacy and passion. Marshall O. Roberts bought the painting for $10,000 according to the official data that would be a whopping $342,000 today, which sounds like a freaking deal to be honest. The Death of Socrates, Jacques-Louis David. This touching painting will mean almost nothing to the viewer without context and knowing the story. For example, the painting could be a depiction of a group of classical style men having interesting conversation. And at one point, a servant gives them the most important man in the center a cocktail, wine back in the day. However, what the man is giving him is poison hemlock. Socrates, who lived from 470 to 390 BC, was one of the most disruptive philosophers in classical times. That's it. Now you know the top things to see at the Met. If you like this video, give us a like. If you love it, subscribe. We have tons of great content. And if you subscribe, more people will see our videos and you'll see more of our videos as well. Thank you very much.